the oldest and strongest human emotion is fear. And the oldest and strongest type of fear is trepidation of the unknown. When we were children, our parents told us that monsters didn't exist. But we were sure that something was lurking under the bed or in the closet. Fear sees even if our eyes are closed. Welcome to the realm of the arcane. My name is Lon Strickler. Join me as I examine unexplained creatures, strange manifestations, and remarkable realities. Imagine this next hour as a voyage of discovery to strange lands, seeking not for new territory, but for new knowledge of the supernatural. Come on board as we begin this adventure together. Hey folks, good evening and welcome to another episode of Arcane Radio where we explore the unexplained live on Beyond Explanation. Now, I'm your host, Lon Strickler, coming to you within a cannon shot of historic Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Now, before we get started, I'm going to again ask you for a favor. Arcane Radio and the Beyond Explanation YouTube channel is made possible by you liking, subscribing, and sharing our programming. And as it becomes more and more difficult to finance this venture, super chat donations are essential for us to continue offering you our unique content. So uh, your consideration is very much needed and appreciated. <clears throat> now, before we get started, I'm going to talk a bit about a, uh, a recent post I had over Fans of Monsters. Apparently a summer... Uh, Camp staff member recalls frightening human like screams and growls that he and others heard late at night in South Central Wisconsin. So um, he actually writes that in the summer, I work at a camp in, James, in Janesville, Wisconsin. The cabins that staff, uh, that's, you know, with staff have screen windows and screen doors meaning you can hear everything going on outside of the cabins. Now, I had left my cabin around 11 p.m. to go shower, and uh, when my bunkmate and I got back to our cabin around 12.30 a.m., she crawled into bed and fell asleep, but I stayed up and put my earbuds in low volume so it wouldn't wake her. Now, around 1 a.m., I thought I heard a fox screaming or coyotes in the distance of me being a nature lover. I wanted to hear it, so I got up and stood by the door. I love listening to coyotes and foxes in the distance. Now, I soon went back to bed, but around 1.30 a.m., I heard this human-like high-pitched screaming that continued for no more than 15 seconds before turning into a deep growl mixed with screeching. <clears throat> this went on for about 30 seconds, all in one continuous breath, not spaced out like a, a fox or a coyote. I know the distance when it comes to sound, especially, and it couldn't have been more than 30 foot from the cabins. Now, when I tell you this sent shivers down my spine, and woke me up like I had just drank 12 cups of coffee. It freaked me out. I sat straight up in my bed, expecting to see something at the door staring at me, but nothing. Then this loud thumping, like a horse galloping, running on you know, what sounded like two legs instead of four, uh, quickly went in the other direction away from the cabins. I got up and bolted the door so quickly, even though screen doors or windows, you know, wouldn't have much to do with me feeling safe. I, I thought I was going nuts until my friend in the cabin next to us, which the cabins were very close. He whispered, hey, did you, did you hear that? Did you hear that too? So with a panic in his voice, that's how I knew I wasn't dreaming. I don't know if anyone else heard it as a... A lot of the guys are heavy sleepers, and my bunkie slept with earplugs in. Now, I've been trying to figure out exactly what it was for the rest of the summer, but because of the poison ivy running rampant everywhere, um, you know, we couldn't check too well for footprints. 
uh, or where the noise came from. I was going to set up a trail cam in this area for the summer 2020 camp, but then again, with the COVID pandemic, it, that just didn't happen. So uh, this, this occurred in summer 2019. And for the past five years I've worked there, uh, we have found a lot of shredded deer carcasses, turkeys, and other small animals. Now, I've been trying to figure out what the hell I heard that night because it's haunted me ever since then. And it's like no animal I've ever heard before. So this area, that's Rock County, that's southwest, uh, well, south central, excuse me, Wisconsin. Uh, outside. This camp is just outside of Janesville, from what I understand. And of course, that area is very near all the upright canine settings and encounters that uh, uh, Linda Godfrey has been reporting for years. We've gotten a lot of reports there as well. This is also an area which uh, winged humanoids have also been reported. So I don't know what it is that um, this person experienced, but uh, hopefully we can get some information later on or something else comes up. I, I'm kind of interested to really know what these sounds were and what made them. So tonight, I welcome Patrick Meachin, haunting survivor, exorcist, and author to Arcane Radio. Patrick is a survivor of two consecutive yet unrelated haunted houses. Through his experiences, he's learned how to engage in spiritual warfare according to the Bible. Patrick also ministers deliverance and has performed numerous exorcisms. His book, Nightmare in Holmes County, documents the true events of one man's eight-year battle with the powers of darkness. Uh, he's also trenched in a spiritual battle against ancient curses and the witchcraft practiced by those around you. Now, Nightmare in Holmes County takes you on a one-man's journey through uh, through hell on earth in the heart of Amish country. Uh, through the story, though the story seems impossible, it is true to real life, and this second edition includes even more evidence to support these claims. So, Patrick, thanks for joining me this evening. Thank you, Lon. It's nice to be on your program. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, it's been almost five years, I think. Yeah. Um, 2016, I think, was the last time. That's been a while. Yeah. Uh, I, I, we must have just started, I think um, uh, Sean and I maybe had just started Arcane Radio around that time. Yeah. So um, let's go ahead and, and go back and tell the listeners the details of this haunting and the uh, subsequent issues you faced in your home in Holmes County, Ohio. Okay. Um, what well, started around... Um, 2001, in the fall, me and my ex-wife, now ex-wife, uh, purchased a plot of land in uh, Amish country in Holmes County. It was a beautiful piece of land. I mean, it, it, it looked like something out of a Thomas Kincaid painting. It was very, you know, the way the hills rolled and it was, you know, Amish farms around us. It, uh, it really seemed like the kind of uh, situation where we were going to build our dream home and live happily ever after. And uh, that's what we fully expected. So we uh, purchased the land in the fall of 2001. In 2002, early in the year, uh, construction began. Uh, and I believe it was March of uh, 2002, the unthinkable happened. We were contacted by the builder one Saturday night. I was working and I received a phone call from the builder. And he said, um, you know, I have bad news, he said, uh, th we had a windstorm and your house is demolished. Now, at that point, it had been built completely framed up. It was a two story house, completely framed up. He had put on the exterior uh, wood sheeting for the walls. And, um, you know, everything was going along great. The basement was, you know, all the basement walls were done, everything. And he said, he kept saying, I've never seen anything like that, like this happen before. This guy was in his, I would say at that time, late 60s. You know, he had uh, been born Amish. So uh, 
as Lon, you probably know, uh, you know, with the Amish, they instill a great work ethic in their children. So therefore, this guy had been working construction, you know, literally almost his entire life. And uh, he's saying, I've never seen anything like this. And uh, we went to the building site. The house was literally demolished. Uh, in the book, there's a picture of me standing over the what's left. You know, it's basically flattened. And I just thought, you know, it's a freak accident, whatever, you know. Um, and, you know, they, they tore everything away, cleared it away, started rebuilding the house at that point, you know, and they rebuilt it and it was completed, um, towards the end of the summer, uh, the house was finished, you know, and, and over the summer, you know, I would stop a lot. Um, we did a lot of the woodwork ourselves, as far as, um, we had oak doors and woodwork and everything, and we did the finishing ourselves to save money. And so I spent a lot of evenings, I would go to the house uh, very late at night. And uh, and again, I'm not familiar with that area. I'm not from Holmes County, you know, and I would just stop uh, when I was driving home and I would uh, go to this house in the middle of nowhere. There's, you know, everything's pitch black around me, except that, you know, the house when you go in and turn on the lights because there's just Amish farms and everything. So um, I would go in and I would start working on, the, you know, finishing the doors and the woodwork. And often I would just have this feeling that I was being watched and I would always think, okay, well, you're not familiar with this place. You're not familiar with this area. You're, you know, that's all it is, you know, but I started noticing I would, I would take a, a radio and I would listen to worship music and, uh, and that seemed to help. I would get, get my mind off of feeling kind of creeped out, you know, but I always would have that feeling that some, somebody was there watching me. So uh, one one day on my way to work, I stopped at, you know, at the building site and the uh, the builders talking to me about, you know, how things are coming along. And he had this one guy that worked for him and he was a very strange individual. And this individual lived on a hill with his parents who were still Amish. He was not Amish, but the family was his family was. And um, he was just a very odd individual. And, and uh, their house was on top of a hill that oversaw the valley where our house was being built. And uh, he's sitting there on a, like on his lunchbox in the garage when, I, when I'm talking to the builder. And he just really seems out of sorts. He seems like he's very uncomfortable. His eyes are kind of big. He just seems like something's eating at him. And uh, he says to me, um, there was a man here last night. Now keep in mind his house oversees my house through the valley, you know, he can see it. And um, I said, what are you talking about? And he says, I had to take my guitar over to Sims garage. Now to get to Sims garage, he had to come down off of the hill and cut across this township road we lived on. It was about a mile long and then intersect with um, the next major road and that's where this garage was, where he was having his, his car worked on. So he says he, he drove down the road past my house. And he said, I saw this guy in the weeds, in the brush, at, in the brush at the edge of your property, watching the house. And he said, he really looked scary. And he said, I was so scared. He said, after I dropped my car off at the garage, I walked home. And he said, I wouldn't come back down your road. He said, I walked the, the long way and went the whole way around to avoid passing this guy again. So this guy literally walked several miles out of his way, according to what he's telling me, because he did not want to come back down this road. So I just thought, well, whatever, you know, and I said, well, you know, I have guns. I said, if somebody comes around here and makes me feel threatened, I will shoot him. You know, I said, I'm going to make sure, you know, my wife's safe. I'm safe, you know, and he seemed really uncomfortable when I said that. And, um, but I just thought, you know, whatever, and, you know, as we moved into the house then and we started, um, you know, experiencing strange things like, you know, at first my my wife was saying things like, you know, when you're at work at night and I'm here alone, I hear noises that scare me. She said it, it sounds like the place is haunted or something. Now, she was a very level headed individual, not really. Um, I would say at that time, she didn't really have a put a whole lot of stock into any stories about haunting or anything at that point. You know, that just wasn't her thing, you know, but she felt very uncomfortable. So um, I started noticing it, too. And so we called in some house inspectors. Now, I'm not talking ghost hunters or something like that. These were inspectors to check the construction. They did find multiple problems. 
Um, we then had to go through a whole process. We had to have things fixed because the builder did not do some things correctly. And what was happening was you were hearing all these noises when it, it was a very windy valley, you know, and we're out in the open. So when the wind's blowing strong, the house, things are happening that shouldn't be because the, the house hadn't been constructed properly. So we had these things all fixed. Um, at one point we hired an attorney, we were going to go after the builder. And um, after we paid the attorney a lot of money, you know, he gets to where he's not returning our phone calls. So I'm like, forget it. You know, we're going to eat the loss. The house is fixed now. It is the way we wanted it. Everything's good. You know, we're just going to move on. So that's what we intended. So after that point, you know, these things have been fixed. One of the first things I noticed that really just seemed strange to me, this was a short time after Easter in 2002. And we had a room when you came out of the uh, garage and we called it the mud room. There was a utility tub, a washer, dryer, and a closet. In the closet is where we kept, we had a couple of cats. And I kept their litter box in the closet, their food was in the closet, everything, you know. So um, I'm in there one night feeding them, and the dryer door opens by itself. Mm -hmm. And I thought, man, that's strange. A, the, way a, the way a dryer door latches shut, you know, you got to pull on it pretty good. That's kind of odd, you know. I didn't think a whole lot of it, but I, I did think it was strange. So as time progressed, you know, the scary noises we were hearing because of construction issues, those had ceased, but there continued to be activity that, you know, just didn't seem right. It, it, I couldn't explain some of the things I was noticing. So as time goes on, you know, that activity starts to increase somewhat. And another night, you know, we had gotten a uh, an, a kitten named Zoe. She was real little, calico kitten. And we had a, a big tabby cat named Moses. And uh, they didn't really look alike. Moses was a big cat. She was a little kitten. And uh, one night, I was still up getting ready to go to bed. My wife's already upstairs in bed. And I go in there and put food in their dish. And when I did that, I swear, I see Zoe come running in and she runs over to the dish and starts eating. And I thought, I looked right at her and I thought, how cute, you know, this little kitten, she's so cute, you know. I put the food away. I walk out of the mud room. I walk through the house into the foyer and I go towards the front door. I turn and go up the stairs. And as I start up the stairs, Zoe is sitting on the top step staring at me. And I thought, that's impossible. She can't be there. And then I thought, well, that had to be Moses I saw in, in the mudroom eating. But I'm thinking, they don't look alike, you know. So I'm convincing myself as I'm going up the stairs, it was Moses. You know, my mind played tricks on me, whatever. I go up the stairs, past Zoe, walk across the landing, open the bedroom door, and Moses is sleeping on the bed with my ex-wife. And I thought, that is impossible. So... The next day, I'm like, I have to tell her, but she's going to think I'm crazy or think, you know, she's not going to buy this at all. So I told her what happened, exactly how it happened. And she starts saying, don't even tell me that. Don't even tell me that. And I'm thinking she's going to say, you're crazy. I'm married to a crazy person, you know, and because uh, she's saying, don't even tell me that. And then she says, there are times when you're at work and I'm at home alone and I'm downstairs on the elliptical. We had an elliptical trainer downstairs and I had some weights and things down there. And uh, she said, I'll be on the elliptical when I'm home alone. And I will swear that I see Moses out of the corner of my eye run through the room. And then I remember Moses is upstairs and we don't even let him in the basement and the basement door is closed. You know, and so at that point, I'm like, OK, that is crazy. I totally believe her. She has no reason to say that. That's not really the way she she operates anyway. She's not going to lie about something like that, you know? So we both started, you know, taking notice that something's wrong. There's something going on here, you know? Um, over time, as is, I believe, the case in most hauntings, when you live in an environment where there is a uh, possession of the property or the house, the spirits that are there turn people against each other. You know, they know um, where I'm weak, they know where she's weak, they know what's going to set me off, they know what's going to set her up, and they turn people against each other. 
I think they're very good at that. And we started not getting along. We started having issues, you know, and um, but as you know, I'm seeing the marriage is kind of falling apart, but the activity seems to be increasing as well. And I'm contributing this in my mind to this is all because the house is haunted and it's, you know, it's tearing the marriage apart. So there were times I even like towards the end of the marriage, I was um, like one time, in, for, for instance, um, you know, we had discussed there's something, something's going on here. And uh, at one point I, uh, I woke up one morning and my alarm clock is going off and it won't turn off. You know, I'm, I'm turning it off. It won't turn off. I'm flipping all the levers and everything. Nothing will turn it off. So I called her in the room and I said, you've got to see this, you know? So she walk, she comes in. I think she thought, oh, he's stupid. He, Cause at that point we are not getting along. And I think she's thinking, um, he just doesn't know how to turn the alarm clock off. What a dummy, you know, she walks in, she grabs it. She does everything I just did, tries to turn it off. It will not turn off. And she, she gets a dumbfounded look on her face. And like, she's confused too. She reaches over and unplugs it. And she says, okay, that is strange. You know? And I said, I know I, I told you, you know, um, it just starts seeming like as, as things are winding down in the marriage, you know, I'm stay, I'm pretty stressed out. So I'm staying up all night praying because I'm convinced that what's going on is attributed to this house. And I'm praying and I always feel like somebody's watching me again. You know, she's upstairs sleeping. I'm downstairs in the living room or in the great room praying. And I always, I mean, many times I would stop and open my eyes and look around the room, fully expecting, man, somebody's here. Did she come downstairs and I didn't hear her and there's nobody there. So as more and more things begin to happen, um, and there, there's a, a lot of other stories that are in the book that are, you know, I, I'm not going to get into here just for time's sake, but a lot of very strange things begin to happen. And uh, I come home one day in October and she's gone. So uh, I finally, a couple of days later, I'm able to get a hold of her. And one of the things she says to me is that, um, on the previous Friday night, early Saturday morning. So it actually had been Saturday morning at 3 a.m., which of course I was downstairs and I fell asleep down there on the couch. She said that at three in the morning, she heard someone ring the doorbell and let themselves in the house. And I said, I, I'm thinking she's accusing me of somebody else's involved in the marriage or something, you know, which is 100% false. And, I, and I'm like, that didn't happen. I said, I was sleeping down there. If somebody rang the doorbell, I would have heard it. And I never heard anybody come in and I didn't let anybody in. And she said, um, that I heard it, you know, and, uh, we discussed them beyond that. We were, it was, it was over. We're getting a divorce, whatever. And, um, I, you know, I, as I hung up and my head spinning, I'm thinking, you know, she actually said that someone rang the doorbell and let themselves in. She never really did accuse me of doing it. You know, it's very strange. And then she left abruptly with a crock pot full of food still cooking and leaves the house and it's not coming back, you know? So over the next few months, I thought, you know, it seemed like the activity kind of tapered off. So again, I'm, I'm attributing this to maybe she was doing something. Maybe she opened some doors. Maybe this all was back, goes back to her because I'm not really having experiences anymore, you know? And um, beginning of February, we, the divorce was finalized and I'm there now by myself. And I had assumed all marital debt. So I knew that the house and property had a lot of uh, equity because the property values had gone up substantially after we bought the property and the house we got built. I mean, the builder did take, take shortcuts and cut corners and we had to pay the, to have those things fixed, but we did get the house built for much less than what it ended up being worth. So I was like, okay, look, I'm, I'll assume all the debt for the marriage. I'll sell the house. I'll take the equity and move on with my life, you know? Um, but I'm kind of in a bad situation because, you know, the idea was not my idea to get the divorce. So I'm kind of going through, you know, someone who's going through that understands it's, it's traumatic, emotionally traumatic. It's not something I would wish on anyone, put it that way. And uh, so I'm there alone and things start happening after the divorce things begin to happen in the house more. And one of the first things that removed all doubt to me, this place is haunted, you know, was, uh, I believe it was February 11th. This would have been 2007. 
and we had had this, this was a Sunday and we had began began having heavy snow on Friday. So I brought, you know, I built a big dog kennel out at the very back of the where the yard met the field that we owned behind the house. And uh, we had two dogs, Maggie and Copper, and uh, I brought them in because it was the weather was bad, you know. So I brought them into the they stayed in the garage. I had, you know, dog cages for them and I just go out and take them out every so often to to walk or whatever. And um I wake up then on Sunday. Now I know I have not been outside um, at the back of the house, you know, since the snow started. And, you know, I brought the dogs in. That was that. And we got a lot of snow after that. And uh, I wake up and the house is freezing. And I'm thinking, what in the world? Why is the house so cold? You know, I checked the thermostat. It is cold. You know, the temperatures drop substantially. And I thought, okay, we have a thousand gallon propane tank. It was 40% full last week. There's no way we went through 400 gallons of propane in that amount of time. There's no way. And uh, so I'm trying to figure out what to do. And I called my propane supplier and he said, um, he said, I can do an emergency delivery on Sunday if you are if you are out. But he said, I, ha I have to charge you a little bit more because it is a weekend and we don't normally deliver on weekends. But he said, before I get to that, he said, you need to check the vent on your regulator and see if maybe, you know, it's froze over because this weather is so bad. And I don't even know what that means. You know, I don't know about vents on regulators or any of those things. But I said, OK, so I take my cordless phone. I go out the patio door. I walk around the house to where the regulator is mounted to the side of the house. There's a pipe that comes off of the regulator and goes underground to the underground thousand gallon propane tank. And as I, I lean over and the, the snow is right up to the bottom of the regulator. So I gently push all the snow away from the pipe, you know, so I can see what's going on. And as I do that, you know, there's a shutoff valve on the pipe. And I noticed the shutoff valve was turned completely sideways. So while well, well, he's trying to explain about this vent on the regulator, I, uh, I said, wait a second. I said, you know, the arm on this, on the pipe, the shutoff valve, it's turned sideways. And I said, could that be the problem? And he said, yeah, your shutoff valve's turned off. He said, that's your problem. The propane's not coming through the line because you shut off your, your, your uh, shutoff valve. And I said, I never touched this. I have not touched this since that we had the, the pipe you know, or the uh, underground tank installed. I have never touched this. I didn't do it. And he said, okay, I believe you, but somebody did. And I said, you don't understand. The snow is completely undisturbed. I had heat last night. Today, I have no heat. I said, this had to have happened overnight. There are no footprints in the snow. This snow was here yesterday. And he said, I can't explain that. But he said, I guarantee if you turn that shutoff valve back open, you're going to hear the gas go through the line, go in the house, light your pilot lights, you'll be fine. So I did. He was right. There was no explanation whatsoever for how this shutoff valve under a foot of snow gets turned off without the snow being disturbed. It's impossible. So at that point, I was like, okay, you know, you've suspected the place is haunted. There's no, no explanation for this. You got problems, you know. From that point, I just began having, you know, experience after experience. So I, I put the house on the market um, late winter, early. Actually, it was late winter. I put the house on the market began trying to sell it and you know i'm having no success with selling the house the activity in the house is increasing you know then one thing that i think people who have lived through an experience like this know and who have gone through a divorce you know that it really wasn't their idea they really didn't want is you know you're you're in, in a bad situation from the divorce you're still emotionally a wreck that's just how it is you know but, don't, but we're, when you're in an environment where there is a, a, a demonic possession situation of that building or that house or whatever, you are oppressed. You are on their turf, the demon's turf you're on in, in their environment. And that is why I say it's like a hell on earth situation. In hell, you're their turf. That's where they, that's their domain. That's the devil's domain. But if you're in a place on earth where they are infested, it's like hell on earth to a, you know, the way they attack you. I mean, obviously hell is worse itself, but you're in a situation on earth that is terrible. You are oppressed. 
um, they, they impose their doom and gloom onto you, you know, so a demon spirit cannot be redeemed. You know, they're a fallen angel. They can't be redeemed. They know that their goal is to take as many people to hell as they can. And um, they impose their doom and gloom that they feel because they know they're unredeemable onto you. That is not a good environment to be in. It's very, very difficult. So while I'm going through all this, you know, I start studying uh, anything I can get my hands on about demonic possession, haunted houses. What's the Bible say about this? Does Because, you know, I occasionally heard things in church um, about things like this, as far as people being possessed, things like that. And, uh, you know, I heard stories over the years, you know, especially years earlier um, of, you know, uh, possession issues. I heard them in church, you know, things like that. Occasionally somebody in church would have had an experience at, an, uh, you know, another church or something, or the pastor shared a story with me, whatever. But I, ne you never heard it really preached about a whole lot. So I'm kind of like, I, uh, I need to know more. So I start researching these things. And as I start researching and start learning, okay, this is what causes a haunting. This is what causes a place to be possessed. This is what causes a person to be possessed. And this is how you get rid of it. As I start to learn those things, I start to come across people that I know that, you know, I, I know them well enough to know they're telling me the truth and they're a sane individual and they're telling me, I think I might have problems, you know, I think that I might have be possessed, you know, and this starts leading into, um, you know, start off with one individual that uh, asked me point blank one day, point blank. This person says, do you think I have a demon? And I said, yeah, I do. I do think that. And, 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 and this individual told me when you said that I knew that it was true. I knew that I really did. And the demons I had in me knew that you knew, and they were not happy. And it, this turned into, this individual started going to a minister um, in another town in Ohio. It was a little bit of a drive, but th this, another pastor who had been trained by Bob Larson had, th this guy had done some exorcisms and it turned kind of into, you know, me working with him and kind of telling him what I suspected and, you know, what I thought I might be discerning about this possession issue with that individual. And it always ended up being true, you know, and then it turned to, I was having to do deliverance as well on this individual. And the thing that was crazy was there were things that happened that I knew things that I shouldn't have known, but I knew they were true and they ended up being true. And I, those were things in regards to what demons this individual had and where they got them, where they came from, why this individual had them. And I started to come to grips with, you know, your whole life, you have kind of had these weird experiences where you knew something that you really had no way of knowing and it ended up being true. And it was always something spiritual. When those things would happen, it would always be, when, when I look back, this is related to something spiritual that I know, I'm knowing this. And I come to grips with, you know, I knew everybody has spiritual gifts, everybody. And I came to grips with, I think I have a gift of discernment and knowledge, so I'm able to discern things. And I think people that God really wants to be involved with deliverance and deliverance ministry and things like that, he gives the, those people these particular gifts because it kind of gives you the upper hand in, in a lot of situations when you're dealing with demons. So you are, you're in a place where the demons are trying to lie and conceal why they're there, but uh, you're able to discern otherwise. So this turned into me basically being able to do deliverances on this individual. And it took several because this person had a lot of spiritual baggage. Uh, really no fault of the individual. There was generational curses, things like that. So we, I'm working through this, but then I'm going home. Okay, I just cast devils out of this person. And then I go home to a house that for some reason I can't get cleansed. And I'm, I'm sleeping with a Bible open on my chest, literally laying on my back with a Bible open because I'm like, I probably just made some spiritual darkness upset with me tonight. And now I'm in this house that I can't get it cleansed. I don't know why, but I can't. And I'm sure I'm going to be messed with, you know. So that's kind of all going into what I'm dealing with. I'm, I'm, I'm able to help others, but I can't help myself for some reason. And, and 
I'm having these experiences and the oppression, you know, and, and uh, you know, emotional baggage really because of what had recently occurred. So this is the situation I find myself in. And it is very, it's very difficult, you know, and I'm having experiences that are mind boggling. You know, I'll tell you a few of them, you know, and it, it, it was like something that kind of really messes with your head when you are living in a new house and it's haunted because, you know, you expect a haunted house. Oh, it's an old house. It's a hundred year old house and it's haunted. Okay. That makes sense. And you picture that most people do an old house would be the haunted house. This was a new house. And uh, so it, it actually was kind of, uh, it kind of was uh, like really something that pu is puzzling. It kind of messes with your head, but it wasn't like every second that I was there, I was having experiences. Mm -hmm. And, but I remember one night in particular, I'm sitting in a room we called the great room. It had a vaulted ceiling in the fireplace and a TV. And I'm sitting in there eating and watching TV and I don't really feel creeped out. I'm not having anything strange happen right, happen right then. And I'm sitting there eating and my two cats, Moses and Zoe, are sitting off to my left. And if I look to my left, there's a TV. If I look straight ahead, there's the fireplace. If I look to my right, I can see the whole way to the other side of the house where the kitchen is because the house was built with a very open concept. And if I go to my right, if I go back, then there's a, a, a sunroom. If I go through the open area and then right across, right to my right in the open area, then it leads right into the foyer, which is at the front of the house. I'm sitting there. So I'm just kind of explaining that so you can kind of understand the, the layout. And I'm sitting there not even having a scary feeling, nothing. It just I'm eating, watching TV, whatever. And I look up and I'm just getting ready to take a bite of food. I'm looking straight ahead. And I see out of the corner, out of my peripheral vision to my right, I see a black mass go straight through the open area and disappear into the foyer. When I saw that, at the exact same time, to my left, I, you know, Moses and Zoe are both sitting there right beside each other. I saw both of their heads follow the trajectory of this black mass as it shot through the room. I knew I saw it here and out of this side I saw Moses and Zoe, they watched it go past. So I knew I, you did not imagine this, you know, um, that's pretty unsettling, you know, and another night um, I'm up right, just getting ready to go to bed and I'm in the kitchen and I didn't have curtains over the kitchen windows behind the sink. And I always mix like water with apple cider vinegar before I went to bed. So I'm, I mix up my concoction and I'm, uh, I'm getting ready to drink it. And there's a light on behind me and overhead that's a big overhead kitchen light. And as, as I'm standing at the sink, if I look at the window behind the sink, I, I can see my reflection almost like a mirror. I'm very clearly see my reflection because it's pitch dark outside. It was around one in the morning, I believe, when it happened. And um, I mix up my concoction, you know, with ice water and apple cider vinegar. I go to drink it as I tip my head up or tip the cup up, my eyes just naturally fall straight on the window. And I see plain as day, my reflection. And I see a, like a black shadow person over my left shoulder. And it's like, when I saw it, it disappeared in a downward motion. Mm. No mistake about it. I saw it, it was there and it moved. Like when I saw it, it moved and disappeared. So, you know, I'm having these kinds of experiences, uh, you know, the TV turning on by itself, you know, all sorts of, of experiences that are very unsettling. And uh, I mean, just some of them are downright terrifying. I, I came to, there's a little, a, a phrase that I kind of came up with living in, in, in that environment after some of these experiences. And it was this, you know, when you've lived through some of these experiences, there is no word that really describes the feeling you have. Terror is the worst word I know, but it doesn't do justice to the feelings that come over you during these experiences. And, you know, being someone who is a person of faith, and, and I do believe, you know, there's power in Jesus' name. There's power in the blood of Jesus. I believe these things. These are fundamental things that I believe you get to a place where, okay, I'm going to fight back. 
you know, you just startled me. I didn't see this one coming and I, I am scared, but you, you painted me in a corner and I'm coming out swinging spiritually speaking. And that is many times I had those experiences where it was just, um, you, yeah, you got me on that one, but I'm coming back, you know? And, um, and that was all, all I could do was, you know, take authority in Jesus name, but I couldn't make it leave. It took all the way up till the end of 2009 before I finally found out there was more to the story, you know, and along that, during that time period from the time we built the house till the end of 2009, you know, I, I did have issues with the Amish. Mm -hmm. Um, the builder himself, uh, he had jumped the fence. They call it when someone leaves the Amish church, but he hired and subcontracted to the Amish. So he, you know, was very friendly with them and they were friendly with him. The fact that I butted heads with him at all, I think did not, you know, it's kind of set a bad situation for me. And I had many experiences with them trespassing on my land, deliberately provoking me, um, they would come and they wanted the property when it went up for sale, they wanted it. But the way they were looking at it, it was this, you're an outsider. You're not from Holmes County. We are, we're going to, we'll buy it, but we're going to buy it on our terms. And that's going to be way less than you know that it's worth. So they would smash the realtor signs. You know, they would, they would call and harass me. There were so many situations and I detail a lot of those in the book. But it was very stressful. I mean, I'm going to be honest. There were many times at the end of the day, I really had to repent because there were some near fight situations. And um, I really kind of lost my coal several times. And, and I'm not proud of it, but it, it's just it is what it is. You know, I got provoked. I had a lot stacked against me. And, um, you know, I definitely uh, went against what I really believe a person, how a person should behave, you know, and I wanted to fight. And, you, you know, what I found out was, in those situations, they're not going to fight you. They're going to back down eventually, but they're going to come back when you're not there or they're going to come back in the middle of the night and they're going to mess with you. And the other thing was, you know, I, I, I'm sit, I'm outside working one day with this beautiful landscape around me and I'm working, you know, it's beautiful, sunny day. Every, everywhere I look is beauty. And then I, this thought comes into my mind. They're practicing witchcraft old world witchcraft. That's what comes to my mind. And I'm like, you know, I, I feel like that's something God just spoke to me, but you know, I don't know. That does make sense. I guess they could be doing that, you know? And uh, eventually I did find out, yeah, that was an issue. They were, there were mm -hmm. people around me. I found out like for a fact were uh, practitioners of different kinds of the occult and witchcraft. Um, especially a form of witchcraft called powwow that is one that the Amish, not all of them, but a lot of them do practice. Um, and I do think that was having a very negative effect on me. It was making the situation, you know, worse. Mm -hmm. And many times I prayed against that, but I really didn't know the whole story yet. So, you know, I probably made a difference and, and um, kept some things at bay because I did pray a lot because I had to, you know, but it still, it wasn't until the fall of 2009 I found out more. There was a deep-rooted curse over the land that I built the house on. Went back centuries, you know. And uh, we, that had to be addressed. And the, the whole way that came together, as I share in the book, you know, like I say in the book, it wasn't my intention to disparage or to glorify any ministries or preachers or groups or anything. I just told the story the way it happened. And there's some negative things I have to say about some churches and there's some positive, but um, ultimately um, the situation came down to, you know, finding out, we, I was able to identify what was the main demonic spirit that was in the house. And uh, it all, all these, when I found out what its name was, you know, I knew then, you know, all the a whole bunch of these experiences all line up with what this demon's name was and what obviously its function was, you know, and we ended up addressing that. And uh, thank God I came out of that uh, successfully. 
because, you know, I was looking at the end of 2009, I was like, wow, I might lose everything I own in 2010 because I'm paying these massive house payments and uh, I'm doing it by myself. And, you know, I don't know how long I can sustain this, you know, and uh, thank God we uh, we were able to deal with it and uh, basically overcome the entire situation and, uh, you know, moved on to my next assignment as I found out, <laughs> you know, it really was the next house was an assignment. It was not um, like I, I had hoped, okay, my nightmare is over. I'm going to move on. I'm going to write about this because I believe this story needs to be shared. I believe that uh, people need to know you can't have victory over the, uh, over the powers of darkness. You can't have victory, mm -hmm. but you need to know how you need to know how to fight back, um, you know, and have some uh, weapons, at your disposal to do that. So I fully planned, I'm going to write this book and I'm going to share what happened. I move into my next house and actually begin to write Nightmare in Holmes County only to find out um, before you get to that, there's another assignment for you. And uh, you know, that became, that assignment became my first book at that time, which was 225th Street. And uh, I knew when I moved into 225th Street and I started to have experiences, I can, you know, I said, there is no way something followed me from Holmes County because that situation was dealt with successfully. That was a successful deliverance, a successful exorcism, if you will. And uh, nothing followed me, but something's not right in this house. As I found out, something was wrong. There was something very much not right in that house. And um, I knew at that time, Nightmare in Holmes County Although you already started it, it's to go on the back burner. It is going to be released as a prequel. And 225th Street, I knew the next, this book I'm writing first is to be the, the address of the house, which was 225th Street. And you have to put all your energy into researching this haunting and your experiences and track down everyone who's lived in this house. You know, the house in Holmes County, me and my ex-wife were the only ones who had lived there at that, up till that point. We built it. You know, before that, the land was farmland going other than going back centuries when it was owned by the Indians and they lived there, you know, mm -hmm. but um, the American Indians lived there, you know, centuries earlier, you know, but um, this house at 225th Street, there had been multiple families that lived there and I knew I had to track them down. I had to interview them and I had to share their stories as part of the book, part of, you know, what I had to share about that. So. You know, basically, I wrote 225th Street. A few years later, I wrote uh, Nightmare in Holmes County. And then over the years since then, I was well aware the activity continued. There were things that happened regarding Holmes County. Uh, there were things that, hap that continued to happen regarding 225th Street. I knew that over the years. But in 2020, in the fall... I was contacted by Beyond the Fray Publishing and uh, uh, Shannon Legro contacted me and she said, you know, would you be interested in having Beyond the Fray Publishing republish your books? And I said, yeah, I would. Um, but I got to be honest with you. Um, there's a lot that's happened since that time. And I would like, if I'm going to share these stories, I got to share the updated versions because there's a lot that has continued. And she said, yeah, I'm good with that. Um, they, the, the, her and her, her partner, uh, Jeff agreed. Yes, we, that's what we want you to do. So they were re, you know, in some ways rewritten. There's a lot of in, new information in both books. 225th street, second edition will be released in the very near future. Uh, Nightmare in Holmes County second edition was just re-released um, a couple months ago. And it has a lot of updated information in it. Um, but, you know, it's it's interesting. I, I was literally responding to Shannon uh, on Messenger when she contacted me at the very first time about having these books republished. In, at the exact time I'm communicating with Shannon, I began having paranormal experiences that I can't explain. There's no explanation. Noises in the next room that I can't identify what in the world caused them. Loud noises. You know, as I searched out that the room where the noises were coming from, there was no explanation. And I, I thought to myself, 
okay, here, it, so it begins, you know, it's all, it's all starting over, but um, I'm well aware when you share these stories, uh, you know, you're going to get messed with. M my perspective is, I believe the stories are scary. I believe they're entertaining, but they're very true. Mm -hmm. I don't have any interest in embellishing something. I, my, I want to tell them that they are true to real life. Other than out of respect to the, some of the people that have told me their stories, I changed names. I did that out of respect. Other than that, the stories are, I mean, to the best of my ability, written exactly how I remember them happening. And with a lot of notes that were taken as these things happened, as I interviewed people, you know, and as experiences happened. So they're, they're very accurate. They're not hyped, you know. So that's basically, you know, both books are true to real life. And uh, again, I've experienced that I, I've experienced activity while working on the books. And that's just something I kind of expected. And I accept when you deal with these things, just count on that, be ready for it. Because, you know, you're, you're shining light into darkness. And the darkness doesn't like it. <laughs> I guess that's well, the best way I know of saying it. Yeah, that does happen. I mean, I've experienced that myself. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many times when I've worked with folks with um, with hauntings and such, and you know, I've experienced a lot of what they've experienced. Yes, and uh, that does that does definitely happen. You know, it, it's interesting. When I first talked to you, uh, and I don't know the first time I, I don't know what year it was the first time I talked to you. Yeah. But we were talking about what was going on in Holmes County. And, yeah. you know, I, I knew it was the second largest uh, Amish community overall in the United States, mm -hmm. just behind Lancaster County. Yeah. But, you know, since you came out, well, there's been a lot coming out about Holmes County and mm -hmm. some of the some of the stuff that's going on there with that Amish community. And yeah. You know, when I first talked to you, I I mentioned to you that I knew somewhat about powwowing and, and folk yeah. magic. Yeah. And I know it can turn it can turn to the dark side pretty easy. Yes. Uh, you know, I've been involved with that with my family and uh uh I there was a uh, uh, uh so called witch or Brockmeister or whatever you want to call them, who was a great great uncle of mine who had mm -hmm. died uh, Nelson Raymeyer here mm -hmm. in this, the York County uh, hex murders. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were related I knew, to that. You were related to the people involved in yeah, that. Oh, yeah, my I, word. yeah. 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 Nelson Raymeyer was a great, great uncle. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I knew all about that when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And of course, I've been there a lot. Uh, one of the guys that's in the group I'm in also spends a lot of time there, has written about it. And, um, yeah, it, it's real. I've experienced things there with myself. So, um, but, you know, when people talk about the Amish, the one thing is, well, they're, you know, they're upright. They're, you know, nice people. They would do, wouldn't do anything to you, but boy, don't cross them. Yeah. It, you you, you got to learn that and you don't cross them. And unfortunately, you ran into a situation and, you know, and it's funny, too. This is something that happened to me last night. I was, for whatever reason, I hadn't gone back over the book, but I started watching a documentary about the Greenville Treaty. Yeah. And then when I saw in your book today how, you know, with, uh, with Tecumseh and the Shawnee and, the, and his brother was the prophet and how yeah. it was related to Chief Cornstalk and yeah, yeah. that whole area. Yeah. That kind of blew my mind. So yeah. uh, it, it, there's a lot tied in with this. There is. And absolutely. And, and you, I, I got to say this, Lon, I'll never forget the first time I was interviewed on your program, we were we were talking about 225th Street. Mm -hmm. I hadn't written Nightmare in Holmes County yet. And uh, I'm you, you, you asked me a little bit about the situation in Holmes County and we were just talking about it and it was live on the interview. And, and uh, you started to laugh and you said, I know where you're going with this. And I was thinking to myself, oh, you might think you do, but I'm sure you don't. <laughs> we went to a commercial break and I said, Lon, where do you think I'm going with this? And you said, you had a powwowler working on you, buddy. And I was like, how in the world did you know that? And you said, I knew it. And you, you would talk a little bit about your background with that. Yeah. And you were dead on accurate, you know. 
And uh, that that was a lot of it. And, you know, that wasn't helping me at all. That's a lot to overcome. If you if you have somebody, you know, that dabbles in the occult and, and has some bad intentions and doesn't like you, that can be bad because spiritually there's power there. Unfortunately, it's dark, but there's power there. And, uh, you know, it's, it was funny in Holmes County. I started um, selling guitars, selling, you know, and teaching guitar lessons, things like that. And um, there was a family that came and uh, they were, I think they were Mennonite. Mm -hmm. They had been Amish, but they became a little bit more modern Mennonite. And there was two kids, one I was teaching guitar, one I was teaching banjo. And their dad would always come and talk to me, you know, when he'd bring them for their lessons. And we'd talk then. And I told him about some of this stuff. And he's like, Oh yeah. He goes, I know you're telling the truth. And he said, um, he said, not all Amish are peace loving. One kid said it to me. He goes, not all Amish are peace loving, you know, but, um, the dad told me, he said, you know, the one neighbor guy that gave me a lot of trouble, he said, his dad was the Bishop in the church I used to go to. And he said, he taught witchcraft in the church. And he said, when I got out of all that, he said, I had to reclaim the land. That's how he put it. And that mean what he meant was, He had to take back areas of his life that he had given over to darkness. Even though he didn't really know what he was doing, he still, he had dabbled in this stuff, not knowing any better because he was, it was taught to him. And he said, I had to reclaim the land. And he said, I I came under a lot of spiritual attack uh, while I was doing that. But he had a lot of, he shared a lot with me about people locally around me. And, uh, you know, one of the things that happened uh, towards the end of my time of getting out of Holmes County. There's a guy like down, there's this creek right below my property, just a few feet off my property. That actually was one of the reasons why the Indians chose where I lived to, as their camp, because it was a nice water supply. It was a beautiful, it was beautiful land. There's a creek there, there's water supply. And uh, so this this guy's down there, I guess he was fishing for minnow or something like that. And I didn't know who he was, and he had parked kind of on the edge of my property. So I went down to talk to him, and it turned out he was a, a retired doctor. And we started talking. He was a really nice guy, and he lived not far from me. And we were just talking about things, and he said, um, you know, he said, with the Amish, there's a lot of genetic mutations because they're close-knit, and sometimes they're ending, they're ending up, you know, intermingling with people that are actually end up being related to them or whatever. And he said, but I'm going to tell you something. He said, um, when you have those things going on genetically, he said, you don't just have, and he said, he didn't mean just because of that, but he said, it's not just genetic problems that are passing on through the bloodline. He goes, there's other problems. And I know, you know what I'm talking about. He was talking about spiritually, like generational curses. And I don't know why he said to me, I know, you know what I'm talking about. And that's my reputation had gotten out into the community, which it probably did. You know, that I, I, I was a Christian who actually chose to, to believe in spiritual warfare. But um, it, it was interesting. Years later then, you know, I'm doing my research and I contact like this uh, historical society for one of the local small communities around where I lived. And the gentleman I'm speaking with, he's telling me some stuff that's pretty interesting about, yeah, he goes, I know some guy lives right by you was doing witchcraft. And uh, but he then said, you know. I had come to the conclusion myself, this is what I'm I'm saying, this is before I tell you what he said, that there were battles fought on my land, people died on my land, and I believe it wasn't just that, I believe people were murdered on my land, and I believe that where I built was on the side that the Indians were given after the Greenville, Greenville Treaty, and I was able to actually document and find old articles from very old newspapers that talked about how in both cases, sometimes, you know, the English, as they call them, accidentally crossed over the treaty line when they were hunting and the Indians murdered them. And then there's places where the Indians actually crossed, accidentally crossed over the treaty line hunting. They didn't know any better. And they were murdered. So there were murders all out there. And I lived very close to the treaty line. And I came to the conclusion, I, you know, I had some things shared with me. And uh, I came to the conclusion that yeah, I believe people were murdered here. And I, I prayed a lot about it. I felt that God did discern that to me. Yeah, it's real. It, it happened. They're not necessarily buried on your property, but people, there was bloodshed here. That that sets up a bad situation also. But um, 
I mean, I'm talking to this gentleman from the historical society. He tells me, Dr. So-and-so, this retired doctor, and I'm like, that's the guy I spoke to, you know, when I lived there. Um, he said he was having a gas line put on his property. And when they dug for the gas line, they found human remains. And he said he never had, he never reported it. He kept, told him just to cover them up and keep quiet about it. But he said there were human remains. Now, technically, that should have been reported. There should have been an investigation. Right. But I believe there are things like that out there. You know, um, if not for that gas line going in, they would have never known there was somebody buried on that property. You know, so yeah. there, there's a lot of strangeness in, in that area. Well, you know, these, these Amish communities overall have a lot of um, a lot of strange stories and a lot of th mysterious things happen. Yeah. within the community and of course yeah. with holmes county you've got a, you've got a whole bunch of uh bad people involved with that uh, you know and you know there have been a lot of tv shows and even a movie made about that yeah. in recent years so uh yeah you know i i i every time i i, I talk to someone about pal wowing and about the uh long lost friend and, and, and yeah. other things as far as folk magic goes. Uh, I always think about your story. I really yeah. do. It, it, you know, you're, you're probably one of the only people that I know has come forth and talked about it. Um, but I know there have been a lot of people affected by that. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, uh, yeah, I'm quite sure there are more people uh, in Holmes County and around that area who were not Amish who, you know, that had to put up with a lot of the problems that are associated with it. So mm -hmm. look, the, the book is, the book is nightmare on home street. You did update it very nicely. Thank you got you. a lot of good stuff in there. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you had to look, you had to go read the book and, and read about when they hung the dead dog up there and all that other yeah. stuff they pulled off on you. Yeah, but no, I was pretty. You know, it was interesting when we first talked. I I knew what was going on. Yeah, I, you know, because I have heard it before, but yeah. I really hadn't talked to anybody about it before. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, you, I, I I'll never forget I, that. I'll never forget <laughs> how you, you knew. Yeah, exactly that was. Well, the the guys that were with me on the show, they were shocked too because they yeah. didn't know what I. You know, they were kind yeah. of surprised I knew about it. Yeah. But yeah, you know, I. When the when the, the second edition of the other book comes out, let me know about it, and I, I know Shan will send me a copy of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm interested to see the update. So, uh, I, you know, I, I, I hope I hope you're doing well. I hope you continue mm -hmm. to do well. Thank you. Uh, are you living it? Are you living in this the same house now? No, I I moved out. Um, I moved out, and and I did a lot of research still while I was living in 225th Street. But I moved out in 2010, and uh, that would be interesting, though, wouldn't it? Doing the interview from inside that house, <laughs> that would be very interesting. You know, it's funny. Uh, my address now is 221 Fifth Street. Is that right? Wow. Yeah. Ain't that weird? <laughs> That's interesting, yeah. <laughs> well, I can Patrick, tell you. Go ahead. Go I'm ahead. sorry. Go ahead. There, is, there is a law added to, I mean, the haunting and the experiences with 225th street have continued there is no question in my mind that i mean bad stuff happens to the people that come in contact with that house and i document it there's a lot of information added i mean and again i went to great lengths to prove what i'm saying because when you say this stuff you're 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 going to be scrutinized you're going to be called a liar you're going to be called a kook you're crazy whatever i went to great lengths to prove, and I mean, I have stacks of documentation, and, and in 225th Street, the next edition, there are notes that I went back and went over because as I started re-examining the activity that continued after I had written 225th Street, mm -hmm. um, it was very clear there were notes that little things in my notes that, oh my goodness, I didn't include this in the first version because it didn't really seem relative at that time, but now I know that it was. So there is a lot of things that are rewritten um, just because there's things I know now that I didn't know then. And then there's a whole lot of additional chapters with new activity um, and, and, and uh, new experiences and, and the things that have happened to even people who helped me with editing that book or any with uh, proofreading. You know, pretty much if you came in contact with that book, stuff happened to you. Yeah. So there's a lot included. Well, 
I look forward to reading it, and I, I want to have you come back, and we'll discuss that as well. I would love to. Okay, Patrick. Well, it's good seeing you again. Good to see you, too. And, God bless you. And you take care, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Now, if you have an unexplained encounter sighting, feel free to contact me through the Fams of Monsters blog site. I want to again thank Patrick Meachin for joining me this evening. And thanks to each and all of you for watching and chatting. If you made a super chat donation, it is truly appreciated. Your support is what makes this possible. Please like, subscribe, and share. So until next week, stay healthy, have a safe and enjoyable weekend. Good night.